very good morning. It's uh, really nice to see you. Um, great to be here. Great to have an opportunity again for God's people to come together to worship the King of Kings and the uh, Lord of Lords. So uh, really pleased that you're here. I'm Mark, one of the leaders here. Um, just looking around, I think you all know um, what you need to know um, on a Sunday morning. So uh, that's great. <laughs> things going on this week after a very, um, well, seemed like a, a good, a busy week in the uh, church last week with lots of um, opportunities to pray. Um, there's lots of opportunities to pray this week as well, like every day, 24-7. So uh, we have a God who hears the prayers of his people. So if you need to pray, you can pray. But we do have some particular opportunities um, to come together through the week, and uh, they're all listed there. They are the normal things. Uh, that we have going on, apart from you'll see on Saturday. So, men, if you want to join me at 7.30, be uh, really lovely to see you. Um, we'll look at the Bible together and uh, pray some more. We read these words in uh, John's Gospel, uh, chapter 9. Lord, I believe, he said, and he worshipped Jesus. Well, I hope those are words that you can declare this morning because our song declares that um, we believe. And uh, there are many things that in Christ um, we believe. Many truths that are ours in Christ. Many hopes and promises that are ours in Christ. So uh, as uh, we stand together, let's uh, sing to him. Um, this I believe.
Let's pray together. Lord, what a great uh, privilege to um, be here this morning, um, to be amongst uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship you, our holy God. Lord, I thank you for the declaration that we've been able to make at the start of our service. We thank you that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the way that you speak into our lives. Lord, we thank you for your holy word. And Lord, that you speak only truth. We thank you for the amazing love of our God and help us to comprehend it even more today as we spend this time together. And we ask that uh, you, Holy Spirit, would help us in our worship, Lord, to uh, speak truth to you and to one another, to hear your voice, and Lord, to speak um, to you together. Lord, please, uh, would you bless us and encourage us in this time, both here in the building, those online, and those that meet in your name around the world. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to read some uh, well-known words to you. Um, I have a Bible in front of me, but if I look at my laptop, it's because I can't see very well. <laughs> so, Luke chapter 2, very well-known words. Um, and this was um, just before um, what we call the Lord's Supper. Um, so they came and they found, they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. That's the disciples. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Of the hand of him who is going to betray me, is with mine on the table. The Lord Jesus, we're reminded so often in our services with those words, um, he gave up his life for us, taking our sin upon himself, giving us freedom in Christ and freedom from our sin, freedom to live. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the one whose blood was shed. Remembered by the people over the centuries from that uh, first Passover where the blood was painted on the doors of the homes so that the children, the firstborn, wouldn't die. But Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the one who has died for us. Uh, we're going to remember, we're going to focus upon our Lord Jesus as we sing uh, our next song, which uh, declares, when I survey the wondrous cross. So as the musicians lead us, if you're able and willing, please stand and let's sing together.
it's in the quietness before I sing our next song, just to consider what that means, what those words um, mean to us. Love so amazing, so divine, with balm to my soul, to my life, my all. What does that mean to you this morning? That he might demand our love, my life. Lord, we ask this. We ask you to uh, help us to uh, respond to your incredible love with our lives. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song that will be familiar to some and not to others, but uh, familiar to all by the end. Uh, let's sing together. Thank you for that uh, declaration that our hope is in Christ. Lord, thank you. Amen. Please have a seat and uh, Claire's going to come and lead us in prayer this morning. Thank you. I should say this is a picture as well um, sent by uh, Rob Reeves. Um, hopefully you can spot him even from the back. 
but it's that guy in the white jump in the middle, and that's Silviani's wife. Um, and uh, I suspect Claire will be praying about the pictures, so I will, if she's not, I will at the end. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Rob Reeves. He's just a local uh, man born in this village, and he went to our local school, Long Sands. Thank you how he was called to serve you um, abroad and to bring this hope, this gospel to so many people, not only in France, but around the world. And, you, and his enthusiasm and infectiousness is, um, and his zeal for you is, is wonderful to see. And uh, may he keep on touching lives through him and his family. He asked us to pray for our two things in particular. The picture shown was a, a group of missionaries from Africa and France and from Korea training to, in order to go out this week to the country of Guinea in West Africa. And he asked us to, to pray for them as they strengthen and help to build up the Pioneer Church in what is a, a very much of a Muslim country. We pray for the success of their endeavors. We pray that they will build up the church, that the gospel will be able to be preached. Lord, we thank you that so many people are willing to to serve you in this way in their full-time capacity, whether it's long-term or not, we don't know. But we do pray for the long-term witness of, of Jesus in that, in that country. We also want to pray for three leaders who are taking on the, um, fre the leadership of the churches in Wavrin, Tumui, and also the mission center. We pray for Mikael, for Etienne, and for Jean. We pray that, you, that they may see God's grace and we'll pray that you will give them success and protection in their developing ministries. Lord, we also pray for the situation in Gaza. Yet another week goes by and we are tempted for our emotions and our be with a bit dulled as we get more desensitized to the violence and all the things that we hear from that part of the world. But yet, Lord, we, the alternative is to feel all the suffering and the hardships very much within our souls. We pray, Lord, that you will direct and lead the politicians and those in positions of power, not only in those countries affected, but all around the world as they seek to influence a good outcome. But Lord, we know that the outcome rests in you, and we pray for your purposes to be done in that land. Yet, Lord, we do hate to see the hardship and the suffering, the hunger and the danger. And we pray for those who, lo who are bringing relief to, to many people who are suffering. Lord, they may, we pray that they may turn to you. Lord, from the psalm, David prays, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And maybe many people in those lands are crying that prayer out to you. How long will this go on for? But yet, Lord, you say, How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? And Lord, as we pray for ourselves as well, we also confess that we often do tend to turn to false gods. We turn to comforts that, we, that don't ultimately sa um, satisfy us and our souls. We pray that all those things that charm me most, that we may sacrifice them to your blood. Help us to be devoted to you this coming week, that we may seek things not of this world, from of an eternal worth. Help us to love and encourage other people that we come across, whether they they belong to your people or whether they are at the moment are outside of your church. Help us to to love others as you've loved us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Bob's going to come and uh, read for us now. Thank you, Bob. Um, just as uh, Bob comes out, we're reading from uh, John 11, verse 45. Um, Sue Jane, what are the um, what are the key stage one group looking at this morning?
demon possessed boy. Okay, so uh, and uh, where's Phil? Phil, what about Key Stage Two? What are they looking at? Great stuff. So uh, here we are in different parts of the Bible together. This just happens to be the passage that we will be doing here in the main room. But don't forget about what the children are doing. Some really exciting things. Demon possessed man. Um, Rich might be happy that he's not preaching on that this morning. I don't know. Um, uh, Phil's dealing with Samuel and the uh, the older children. So Bob, come and read for us uh, what we're going to be doing in here. Thanks. I did say 45. Great. Uh, John, uh, chapter 11, verse 45 to 57, and it's on page 1078 of Church Bible. Right, 45 here we go. Um, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them, what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sendrian. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named uh, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Many thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jim. Um, I don't know about you, but I am so glad that this amazing God that we worship this morning um, did not leave us his people here alone. The Lord Jesus has risen from the dead. That is our hope. And he's ruling and reigning. But for those in Christ, he left um, a deposit for us. And that deposit is his Holy Spirit. He lives within us. And uh, as we look at his word, um, in the, uh, the children's groups uh, here in the main church, uh, we need our Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, to help us. Help us to, uh, to grow in Christ. Corinthians says, Now it is God who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Our hope in Christ, we know it because if you know and love the Lord Jesus, his spirit lives within you. Let's... Uh, Seeing as we uh, now move through our different groups around the, uh, the school building. Um, key stage two, um, you might want to take your coat with you. It's a little bit cold in that particular room. Come praise him for your time. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, Let's ask our Lord for help as we look at his word together. Our God in heaven, you are the God who saves the only God, the only God in existence, and you are a saving God, and we've come to know you through your Son, our Lord Jesus. And we, we, we ask very much as we look at this portion of Scripture together that you would bless it to our hearts and our minds. Lord, Lord, we pray that for our children as well as they go to look at different parts of your word, Lord, that your word would dwell among your people richly this morning. Lord, we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, it will help you lots if you've got um, John eleven forty five to 57 in front of you. Um, as we look at it this morning, um, and as, as we start, um, a number of years ago, Nikki and I decided we were going to watch a film one evening, um, and I wanted to watch um, a film called 127 Hours. Um, and Nick, Nikki hadn't heard of it. Um, I, I said, that's, that's fine, let's, let's watch it. She said, what's it about? I said, that's, that's okay, let's not think about that. Let's just let's, let's watch it and see how it goes. Um, and we did, and it tells the true story of Aaron Ralston, who was hiking in the middle of nowhere, and he falls into a canyon. And in the canyon, a, a boulder's been dislodged, and it traps his arm, and he is um, trapped in the bottom of that canyon for 127 hours. Um, and, and he gets more and more desperate over that period. Uh, and as he gets more desperate, this, this kind of basic survival instinct starts to kick in. He is determined not to be defeated, and he, he has some provisions, they they gradually begin to run out, uh, and he gets more desperate. He takes some action um, in that canyon, desperate action, uh, and he amputates his own arm in order to get free. Um, it is stunning. It's amazing that, that he does get free. It's a gripping story, and uh, Nikki wasn't too impressed when she realized what was happening. Um, but it does show the drive to survive can be very, very powerful, wonderfully powerful, can also be dangerously powerful. Uh, what would you do in order to survive? Uh, what would you do in order to keep what you fear you cannot lose? Now, that's a challenging thought, I think. Uh, not many of us, I hope, uh, will have had or will have the opportunity to be stuck in a canyon with a trapped arm and discover whether we are able to do what Aaron Ralston did. Um, and, but I think day to day there is a continual question What will we do to keep what we fear we cannot lose? Uh, Back in September 22, we at Kingfisher Church began to work our way through John's gospel. Um, We've we've come in and out of it, and we're we're coming back to it again after a bit of a break. We're coming back at the end of chapter 11. Uh, John, one of Jesus' friends who recorded these things that Jesus did um, in his time on earth, and, and, and John collected this material with a specific purpose. He was one of Jesus' close friends. He would have had so much material to draw from, but he chose the stuff he's put into his gospel um, for a particular point, and he tells us that at the end of it. At the end of his writing in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why he writes the gospel and as he tracks what Jesus does and from Galilee in the north of the country right down to Jerusalem, the the signs that Jesus performed, the things that Jesus taught, he puts them in his gospel um, for that reason. And most of John's gospel, or a third of John's gospel, focuses on on the final few days of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. That There's a a building up to something of supreme importance and we are, are just on the edge of that at the end of chapter 11. In fact, the passage we have today tells us of the decisive moment when the religious leaders decide they must kill Jesus. It's been on the cards for a long time, um, but this is the moment when that becomes official policy. It's a time when they say, we're not considering any other options. Jesus must go. And I want us to think about how they got there. I want us to think, why is it that they didn't follow the signs? Why didn't they follow the signs. Well, let's follow what John tells us, starting in verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Now, these these people had seen something that caused them to put their faith in Jesus. What was it that they saw? Well, we need to go back to earlier in chapter 11, where 
Uh, John tells us about um, three siblings in a family. There's Martha, Mary, and finally do go. They arrive at a funeral, in the middle of a funeral, in the five at a funeral, in the middle of a funeral, in the funeral. Martha, first of all, comes out to Jesus and she says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And then Mary comes out and she says exactly the same thing as her sister did. She says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Uh, and Jesus is struck by the grieving. He enters into the grieving and, and as he asks to be taken to the tomb, he goes there with tears on his face. And he stands in front of the tomb and he tells them to take away the stone. And it's awkward. Uh, Martha intervenes. It's, it's in a Middle Eastern climate. The, the body has been in the tomb for four days. There's going to be an odor if you take away the stone. Uh, but Jesus insists that this happens, and, and it does. And then Jesus stands at the entrance of the grave, and he commands, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man comes out. He walks out of the grave. Jesus demonstrates with his words, he is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him will live even though they die. Jesus commands death to release its captive and turns this funeral into a celebration of life. And so in our passage in verse 45, the Jews who saw Jesus do this trusted him. They believed in him. That they trusted he was someone they could commit themselves to in life and in death. He was a safe pair of hands. And then in verse 46, some of them report to the Pharisees. They report what they've seen Jesus do. They go to the Pharisees and say, Jesus has raised a dead man. And they saw Jesus exercise power over death. They heard Jesus invite them to be protected by that death-defeating power. And they report to the Pharisees. The Pharisees now are hearing this report, this testimony that should cause them to put their faith in Jesus. And they don't dismiss it. They take it very seriously. They hear this report, and verse 47 says they call a meeting of the Sanhedrin. It was the Jewish ruling council, the highest authority in the land underneath the Romans. Remember, they were under Roman occupation. But the Romans permitted this council to look after the affairs of the Jewish nation. And this council comes together, and they ask, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many signs. What shall we do? The answer is quite obvious, isn't it? Now, in 2004, a man called Anthony Flew, who was um, a professor at Oxford, he uh, championed a cause of atheism for, for decades in his life, for more than 50 years. But then his thinking changed. He stunned the world when he changed his view, and he became convinced that the only good explanation for the world is that there must be a God. Then he said at that point in 2004, he said, My whole life has been guided by the principle of Plato's Socrates. Follow the evidence wherever it leads. It's a good principle, isn't it? Follow the evidence wherever it leads. So you imagine if Socrates had been at that Sanhedrin in John 11. That there is a man performing many signs. What should we do? Well, what is a sign? A sign points to something, doesn't it? And there are many signs. What do you do with many signs? You follow the signs. That's what you do with a sign. And Socrates would jump up, wouldn't he, at the council? Follow the evidence wherever it leads. Jesus has raised a man from the dead. It is a sign. Follow it. And here they are in the council saying, what should we do? And it's obvious, isn't it? Believe in Jesus. Trust Jesus. Body and soul in life and death. Because the one who believes in him will live even though they die. The Sanhedrin continue. Verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Just, just think about what is going on in their heads. What is their reasoning as they say that? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Jesus is performing many signs. People aren't stupid. They can follow the signs. And if he keeps putting all these signs down, people are going to start following them. And the signs point to believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing they will have life, they will have eternal life. 
be such a bad thing, wouldn't it, if everybody had eternal life? Terrible if everyone starts to believe in Jesus and receives this gift from the one who has power over death. What should we do? It's not like um, a bit later in this same council, a number of years later, there's a man in the council called Gamaliel. And, uh, and he says in that council, he says, don't need to worry about these popularist people. They just give these things time and they all burn themselves out. And he gives some example of some popular, popular people who've led some uprisings and eventually it just burns itself out. But you see here, there is just something different about Jesus and something different about the signs. There's something genuine about the signs. They can't challenge the signs. Lazarus was dead and now he's alive. And it convinces the council. These signs are strong. They're verifiable. Everybody's going to end up believing in Jesus. But they won't follow the signs. They don't follow the evidence wherever it leads. Because it seems to me that they are driven by a drive to survive. They want to they keep what they fear they cannot lose. See what they say? Verse 48 if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. The concern isn't that they lose the temple and the nation. The concern is that they lose our temple and nation. The concern is that they will lose their power and their position. The Romans, they allowed this council to have some autonomy, but it was closely guarded and pretty fragile. The council were allowed a bit of power, but they fear. They, they fear if, they, if there was an uprising, if there was some sort of problem in the nation, the Romans would say, well, you're not able to manage it. Um, so we're going to come and take over. You'll get your power and your position taken from you. So Caiaphas jumps in. He's the high priest. Uh, at that time, it was a, a political, really, more than a religious role. And, and he's pretty rude as he speaks. Apparently, the, the historian Josephus says this is fairly typical for the Sanhedrin, they, that they were pretty rude in the way they spoke to everyone, especially to each other. And he launches in in verse 49. You know nothing at all, you bunch of idiots, is what he says. And you do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Jesus is a threat to the stability of the nation and so obviously, it's better that he dies. It's obviously, <laughs> it's obviously better to knock down the signpost than to follow where it leads, isn't it? No, then you have to worry about the signpost. Signposts can be annoying, can't they? It gets get rid of the signpost, so you don't have to follow it. And notice that he says, it's better for you, better for you, the ruling council. Now, this is, this is the worst type of leadership, isn't it? When the leadership is most concerned about keeping power rather than doing what is right. When they're prepared to kill an innocent man to maintain their position. Now Caiaphas' ruling is as clear-sighted as it is ruthless. And verse 53, the council make their decision. It's official policy. It's made in the council. Uh, official policy. Not a policy to hear Jesus out. Not a policy to arrest him and try him. Not a policy to challenge the veracity of the signs. It is a policy to kill Jesus. And it's not the only option, is it? Now, why didn't they follow the signs? Well, I think that the council understood something very important for anyone who considers Jesus. They understood that Jesus is a disturbing presence. Now, if they did follow the signs and believed in Jesus, it could mean they lose what they treasure most in the world. And they're not prepared for that. But the same is true for anyone who considers the claims of Jesus. Anyone who sees the signs testified to in the Bible, to follow Jesus could mean that you lose your position in life. It could mean that you have to put aside the comforts you've enjoyed or, or the aspirations that you cling to. It, it will mean that you must find your identity in something other than what it has been. You won't be able to stay the way you are. Uh, as, as we read the end of John 11, I don't think we feel much sympathy with the Sanhedrin, but we can be closer to them than we think. 
because they had this thing. For them, it was their position and their power. This thing that mattered most to them. It was the thing that they needed to, to be who they were, that they tied up their identity, their being into having this thing, and Jesus comes, and he is a disturbing presence. He makes him fear they will lose the thing they need to be okay, so they won't follow the signs. They're driven by survival. It's a, a powerful drive to survive. They do what is in their power to do in order to keep what they fear they cannot lose. And they decide to kill Jesus. I wonder about us. I wonder if we would see that Jesus is a disturbing presence in our lives. If you're looking at in it on Christianity from the outside, and you look at the, the Christian faith and, and you think committing my life to Jesus would be quite uncomfortable. If that's what you think, then you're probably on the right track. And, and if you are within and you have followed the signs and you believe in Jesus and you don't experience much discomfort because of it, you might need to start thinking again. As C.S. Lewis said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. I wonder if you would say the same. And, and perhaps the important thing to think about is what we do when discomfort looms. The Sanhedrin didn't follow the signs. They had this thing that they didn't want to lose, so they did what was in their power to do. They planned to kill Jesus. It's not, of course, in our power to kill Jesus, but we can shut him out. We can push his presence to the margins of our lives, and that survival instinct can be spiritually very dangerous. We can do whatever is in our power to keep what we fear we cannot lose. I wonder what that might be for us. I wonder what you fear you cannot lose. That that thing, if you don't have it, if you didn't have this thing, you wouldn't really know who you were. The thing you need in order to be okay. For the Sanhedrin, it was position and power in society. For us, it might be in a similar way, our reputation and what others think of us, what others see when they look at us. It might be some happiness. It could be a, a relationship or a particular set of relationships, our family connections, uh, our career and the job that we have, uh, our, our sense of stability, maybe our fa financial stability, maybe just that kind of sense of being captain of my own fate, being able to decide to do what I want. And, uh, and I wonder if, uh, as, we, as we go on longer in the faith, a kind of stubbornness can grow in our hearts. See, the longer we go on in the faith, the, the more we know of what Jesus requires of us, and we can become more adept at ignoring his challenges. Uh, I read this week, someone said, a healthy, uncomfortable faith constantly rocks you, prods you, and blows your mind. It's a faith that leaves you restless to want to know more, not satisfied you've grasped all there is to grasp about God. It reminded me of the, the beginning of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. A soul panting that counts all things as, as lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And yet the things around us, they wrap up our hearts with cotton wool and whisper we need them more than Christ, so we shut him out or we compartmentalize his work. Now, somebody suggested some signs for us to think about whether we are too comfortable in our faith. Now, I wonder what you think of these. The, the first one, he said, that we are too comfortable in our faith is when there is no friction between your Christianity and your politics. Now, now he's writing from a US perspective where um, kind of Christian things and politics are so tightly wound up in a way they're not really over here. Uh, but I, th I think most of the world is going to the polls this year. There are elections all over the world, including our nation. We are going to be voting. Uh, politics is going to feature highly in our thinking. And what does our faith mean as we vote? 
the, the second thing, second sign that we may be too comfortable is there are no paradoxes, tensions, or unresolved questions for us. Now, we've got to a point where the staggering claims of Christ are failing to stagger us, to settle us. Third one, third sign that people, uh, that, that our, our faith is too comfortable is when people are surprised to hear you're a Christian. Uh, and I think sometimes we can enjoy that if people are surprised to hear we're a Christian because we assume the stereotype for a Christian is someone who is boring, bigoted, and behind everything. Um, so when someone is surprised by our faith, we could take it as a compliment. Uh, but more likely, it means we're so blended into the world that following Jesus makes no observable difference. The, the fourth sign that we may be too comfortable in our faith is this one. No one at your church ever annoys you. It's the same way. We've got too superficial with the commands of Jesus to share our life together. We are, are keeping each other at too comfortable a distance. And the fifth one, fifth sign you're too comfortable in your faith is you never feel challenged, only affirmed. Uh, there's, no, there's no call to, to change in our lives. We just feel that everything is just okay. The Sanhedrin in John 11 didn't want the unsettling presence of Jesus, and so they killed him. Uh, and like them, when we don't want the unsettling presence of Jesus, we do what we can to close him out. And yet the Sanhedrin missed so much, didn't they? No, let's, let's think, what did they miss when they didn't follow the sign? And then what, what are the things that didn't seem to feature in the discussions they had in that council meeting? What, what are the factors which, when we consider these factors, it will swallow up the desperate grab at survival and show something so much better? First of all, at that council meeting, they don't seem to ask, if Jesus has power over death, why fear the Romans? That's the Sanhedrin's fear, that the Romans will come and take away what is most precious. But what have they really got to lose? What have they really got to lose? You'd want to say to them, the power and the freedom you think you have is just an illusion. It's Rome is the power. You're under the iron fist of Rome. You're not really in control of anything. And they did lose everything they had. Like 40 years after this, not because of Jesus, but because of their own constant wrangling for political survival, Rome came and eventually its patience ran out and they did lose everything. But the sign that they're considering in John 11 points to one who has power over death. If Jesus can give that life, that eternal life, what could Rome take from them? You know, there's, there's an occasion when um, Peter, Jesus' disciple, says to him, uh, we left everything to follow you. And, and the disciples did, really. They, they left their homes, their family, their work. They left everything to follow Jesus. They followed the signs. They threw their lot in with Jesus. And, and then Peter says that to Jesus. We left everything. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. But, but then he says, but you're going to get back a hundred times what you lost in this age. And in the age to come, you'll get eternal life. Now, Jesus says, you can't really lose when you follow him. And for the Sanhedrin, yes, the Romans could come and take your place and your position, but it won't be loss when compared with what Jesus gives. And I, and I think we might get that in theory. It's just the practice where we find it harder, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the times when we are confronted with things that feel like they will be loss for us. Just, just to take something as everyday and mundane and as simple as reading your Bible. Now imagine somebody gets, gets through the day, they get to the evening and they, that they sit down in the sofa and they take a big breath and they turn on the TV, they've worked hard and they are ready to enjoy rest and that is a good thing to do. And, th and then they say, as the TV starts up, they just think, oh, do you know what, I've not read my Bible today. I think it would be good for me to read my Bible. And that's the moment when the truth strikes home, isn't it? Do I continue in my present comfort or do I turn off the TV and open my Bible? And we wrestle with that. I know, I wrestle with it. Oh, I think if I lose my rest, this is what my heart's saying, if I lose my rest, it's going to be awful for me. But imagine if we said that to Jesus. Imagine if we went and said, Jesus, I've 
left the comfort of my evening to listen to you in the Bible. So what would he say to us? What do they think they can do to him? Can they really get rid of him? No, they couldn't. Spoiler. Um, they did kill him, but he didn't stay dead. Now, a friend of mine a number of years ago was, well, he, he decided very definitely to, to go on a, on a route through life that he knew was against what the Bible taught. He, he thought he had to. He thought that was the only way to be happy, and he threw himself into this lifestyle. He went on for, for a number of years like it, and then he said that there was this one night when he was lying in bed, and he thought, where is it going? Now, where is this life leading? I'm doing what I think will make me happy, but one day I will die and meet Jesus, and then what will I say? Now, we can choose to ignore Jesus. The Sanhedrin can choose to kill Jesus, but in the end, there's still going to be Jesus. And we must reckon with that. And the third thing, the, the major thing that they missed uh, and the thing to which John turns our attention is that God is doing something so much better than their futile grasps at keeping their power. <clears throat> you see, in the meeting of the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas launches his cynical political realism and he, uh, and he says, you don't realize it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And it is, it's a wicked plan, isn't it? To save their skins, they will kill an innocent man. It is destructive. And then John comments in verse 51. He did not say this on his own. <coughs> That's good, isn't it? He didn't say it on his own. There is something else going on in this, this desperate scheme of wickedness. There is, there is more in the picture than what we can see. There is something more. There is something other, something bigger and better. He did not say this on his own. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. <clears throat> he, John rises above Caiaphas's wicked plan. He shows that this Caiaphas is speaking better than he realizes. His words are a prophetic announcement of what God intends. Now, it's important to see this, isn't it? That Caiaphas intends to ruin Jesus with wicked motives. And yet there is more going on. God intends in the same destructive act to do something so different. And, and what we so often see, is we so often see that outside bit. We see the, the Caiaphas part. We see the things in our life that only look destructive and they, they only look bad and ruinous and awful. But we're reminded here that our God has deeper intentions. That even in the most wicked of plans, the plan to murder the innocent Jesus, in that plan, God is at work intending in that act something inexpressibly good. And the good is found in the little word for, or on behalf of. You see, the sign in question that prompts all of this is raising Lazarus. Jesus demonstrates power over death. He can command death to release those in its hold. But how can death release its victim. Now the Bible teaches us that death has that right and that claim ever since the beginning when God said the soul who sins must die. Death has a claim. Death holds to God's word that sinners belong to it. And those who sin will end in the jaws of death. So every person who has ever lived has sinned and so all have died. Now Psalm 49 puts it like this when, when it says... No one can redeem the life of another or give to God the ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so they should live on forever. Death has an invincible claim proved in every life that has ever been lived that death is the end. So how does Jesus command death to let go? The Psalm 49 goes on and says, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. The great price that no one could ever pay is going to be paid and will be paid by God himself. So the little word for, on behalf of, gently answers the claim of death. See, if the soul that sins is bound up with another, 
bound up with one upon whom death has no claim. And that other gives himself freely into death. And he's one with the authority to lay down his life and take it up again, then on behalf of. Is how he commands death to let go and never come back. Death has now no power over the one for whom Christ has died because his death buys their life. Now, after the council meet in John 11, Jesus withdraws for a time and then verse 55 says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover. It's the Passover that casts its shadow over all John's gospel. And the Passover is the model of what on behalf of means. See, at the Passover, the lamb dies on behalf of the people. The death of the lamb stands for the death of the people. The, the Passover that, that, that celebrated that great memory of when the people were crushed under Egyptian tyranny. And, and in that tyranny, they could do nothing but just cry out and God heard their cry and came to rescue them. He came in judgment over the sin of the Egyptians and to save his people from that judgment, told them to sacrifice a lamb on behalf of the people. And the pictures and the signs were all pictures and signs until the Son of God walked on earth as the Son of Man. And John the Baptist identifies him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now in John's Gospel, that title is reaching its fulfillment. And where Jesus will be the sacrifice provided by God. The ransom price that no one else could provide is provided in Jesus Christ so that he could die on behalf of his people. So his death could answer the claims of the grave and give justice to the authority of his promise. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So the unwitting prophecy of Caiaphas, Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation but also for the scattered children of God. Who are they? Well, people from every nation under heaven. All and any who will follow the signs and believe in Jesus. Are those already mentioned right at the beginning of John's Gospel in chapter 1 when it says, to all who receive Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. The death of Jesus doesn't just release people from the power of death, it creates a whole new life and makes all who believe into the children of God and gathers all who believe into one great body that we call the church and of which we are part today. The Sanhedrin are fixed on what they might lose and miss what they most needed. Plotting how to keep their position and their power and yet God is working a plan of salvation conceived before the creation of the world and celebrated into all eternity. The plan of salvation that Jesus Christ, Son of God, will take our sin upon himself and die in our sin so that we can have the gift of eternal life. Eternal life in eternal love as the children of God. So when we consider whatever our earthly gains may be, that whenever we think of the things that we feel we cannot do without, but then we compare them to the immense goodness of God and his love for us in Christ Jesus, and don't we find ourselves wanting to say with Apostle Paul and Philippians, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. We keep following the signs wherever they lead. Let's take a moment of quiet just to reflect personally, and then we'll pray together.
Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would search our hearts and that you'd fix us upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're going to pray as we sing, uh, asking that the fount of every blessing would tune our hearts to sing his grace. When the musicians are ready, let's stand and sing together. We're back here at 6 o'clock for some reflections on how to use the Psalms to help us pray together. Um, Refreshments are served at the back. Let's end with this. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.